Hey guys, it's Merce. Welcome back to Harpies in the Trees, where I review horror books with a supernatural focus. I hope you checked out my Horror Hearts book tag I did uh, last week. It was just a really fun tag to do. Um, just get to gush over favorite horror booktubers, but definitely not all of them. There were definitely many more people that I could have talked about, but I was already really pushing it by making most of the questions plural instead of singular. <laughs> so today I'm going to review The Vanishment by Jonathan Acliff. You may know him from Naomi's Room and The House Next Door by Darcy Coates. You know, I've read a lot of her books. Uh, I don't really know which number this would be yet, but it's up there. It must be like nine or 10. <laughs> So I've been doing these really fun polls lately on the community tab and YouTube, and it's been actually kind of surprising. I was doing it, you know, what's the scariest location um, for a horror book? And the first winner was Abandoned Asylum. The second winner was Underground Tunnels. And I just put a third one up today, so I'll see what the winner is tomorrow. But it's been really cool to just like, you know, like talk to people a little bit about like, you know, what locations they think are scary. And there was a discussion about the derelict space station, which is a personal favorite of mine. I love Event Horizon. Um, there were some people who talked about Event Horizon as well. And it's just like, I want more haunted space stuff, you know, like, like uh, ghost planets, uh, ghost aliens, ancient uh, beings from somewhere. I love Hellraiser. I know that there was at one point a Hellraiser in space, <laughs> which I don't remember it being like particularly super good. But what I do remember is thinking, how are they, how are they gonna be in space? Like demons in space, this is so, I like it. <laughs> yeah, it was just like, of course. I mean, of course demons could be in space. I mean, they're not human. They've been around for who knows how long, who knows where they came from. Um, so it, they could be in space. I mean, we don't know. So I, that to me is just like, let's do it. I, I would love to, to read something like that. If you know a book that's a der haunted derelict space station, let me know in the comments because I really, really, really want to read one. <laughs> Our story opens up with a woman who is telling us that she lives next to a haunted house. The lawn is dead, the trees and the bushes and the grass and the flowers and all that kind of stuff is just brown and dry. The house itself on the outside is, it looks a bit like it could use maybe a full entire renovation. And I say renovation because this house is actually a pretty old house compared to the rest of the neighborhood. So obviously it's been there for a really long time. It has its own history, but it's more modern history is that nobody has really been able to stay there for very long. One night the neighbor witnesses the current family who's living in the house explode out of the house with a shotgun, get into a car and just burn rubber down the street and they never return. They never come back for their belongings, nothing. A few months go by and the neighbor witnesses a young woman moving in by herself to the house. And the neighbor, whose name is Joe, is burning with curiosity. She knows this is probably her one chance to get to see the inside of the Morwick house, which is what it's called. So she throws together a batch of muffins really quickly and she heads over to introduce herself to the new owner whose name is Anna. She seems to be sort of uncomfortable, maybe like a little bit on high alert when Joe arrives, but she accepts Joe's muffins with relish. She seems to be very hungry and invites the woman inside and they begin to talk. Anna discloses that she is a person who refurbishes dolls. So she takes old Bratz dolls and Barbie dolls and repaints them into a whole entire new doll and sells them online. And it's actually a pretty lucrative business for her. Jo gets the full entire tour throughout the whole entire house. Both her and Anna 
They have a strange experience in the hallway. They think they see a woman in a room looking out through a, a cracked door. And this kind of sets into motion, for Joe at least, that this house really is haunted. Anna and Joe then team up and try to record evidence of there being something supernatural there and try to figure out what's going on because as time is going by, it's getting more and more intense. And while they're trying to figure out this supernatural mystery, there's also the problem of Anna's ex-boyfriend who is stalking her. So I'm a little bit conflicted about this book because it is a really fun ghost story in the sense that it kind of has everything you want. It has a house with a dark secret and a dark past and a mystery, you know, and you know, it has a, a supernatural, these supernatural elements that are happening throughout the house. There is a medium that comes at one point. Um, so there, there's like, those are all like the little things I guess I find to be like really cool elements for a ghost story. Um, because it's just exciting because we get to learn the story about what's happening. We get to, you know, just kind of get lost in the mystery of, you know, what this ghost is doing, what, it, what it means, like if anything, and, uh, you know, getting secret information, you know, hidden information, like from cameras or from mediums or anything like that. So that's really fun. And the origin story of why the house was haunted, I thought was pretty interesting. I guess the things that kind of like held me back from like really just loving the story though was like there were just like a few things that happened between Joe and Anna. They were obvious conveniences, you know, for the story to go where it wanted to go at some point later. And like, you know, every story has that. It's just setting itself up to tell a story how it wants to tell you. But when it jumps up into your face, because it does, it makes so little sense that they would make this decision only so they could make another decision down the road. For instance, and this is in the very beginning of the book, so it's not really a spoiler, but Joe and Anna are talking the first day that they meet. First day, okay? Like, so imagine you have a new neighbor who moves into your spooky house next door and you go over there and, you know, in like, I don't know, a 10 minute conversation, she's like, oh, um, do you mind if, I put your address as my address on my website so that people don't come to my house. <laughs> Absolutely not. Like, no, <laughs> you know, cause that's a red flag. That's like something where you're like, why? Like, if you don't want people to come to your house get a PO box. Our character Joe is like, okay, sure. No problem. <laughs> and like, it's not like we always make the best decisions when talking to people, but I, I, I felt like it should have, like Joe should have had like a little bit more, like she should have asked some questions, you know, about why, you know, like a little more because that's really unusual to do. So there was like some situations like that that were happening where I was like, <sighs> okay. Also Joe and Anna, like their characters were not, I didn't really jive with them very much. Um, Joe is kind of like this really nosy uh, neighbor who does things like will bake you food so that you will have to talk to her and like have to answer her questions, you know? She's really nosy and controlling. Anna's character to me was just so not interesting. She was very meek and wide-eyed constantly, like sort of like a like a bush baby sitting on a twig. I don't know, like she was just, she in the way that she's described, it's just, it seemed like she was just kind of so meek and so pathetic, you know, that she couldn't like do anything for herself, which is kind of where Joe comes in because Joe can kind of like take control, which is like what she likes to do. So you kind of get the yin and yang of why they're operating together. But as characters, they just really weren't that, they weren't that interesting to me. The other thing that was like kind of like uh, hard for me to swallow was the house itself because this house was so overpowered. Like I felt like it just had too much power and I didn't know where this power was coming from and why it would be affecting the the range that it was. And there's also the, these moments where, you know, if someone goes missing for whatever reason, usually there'll be someone who's sniffing around, you know, 
a mom, a sister, a friend, a you know, a boss or something, coworker. Like there's usually someone who's gonna come around and be like, I know you know this person, did they stop by here? But none of that happens. One way I think to really add tension to a story is when the outside world or when reality starts trying to get in. You can't hide from reality, you can't hide from the outside world. It's always gonna be trying to get to you for whatever purposes, uh, benign or not. So the, the story definitely lived in this bubble. I think the tricky thing with like ghost stories are, you know, as a ghost story lover, you have to throw away, and just accept kind of what those rules are in this world, right? But when you're constantly distracted by little things that don't make sense, that could easily make sense if they were written in a different way, that's when it starts pulling you out of the story and that's when, you know, it gets hard to keep swallowing, you know, what you're reading. What I did like about this was the premise though, because it's through the neighbor's eyes, you know, about what's going on. And that's really cool, I think. Um, so we get to be an outsider as much as the main character. And, um, and that's, that's a really that's a really cool setup. I think. I think that's I think that's what I liked um, about the book the most. It was still fun to read, and I really do like the origin story. Like I said, um, I just wouldn't expect like a lot from it. That's all. So I gave this three stars. The vanishment begins with husband and wife Peter and Sarah who are heading to a rental that they are going to stay out for a month or so. They've been having problems in their marriage and this is an opportunity for them to, you know, maybe not repair it, but rejuvenate it, uh, spend some time together and also spend time on their separate hobbies. Sarah is a painter and um, Peter is a writer. When they get to this house, they get there at night so they can't really see it too well, but it looks pretty foreboding. It's a old Victorian mansion. It's sitting near the cliffs of the sea um, and it's really, really dark. When they go into the house, they actually have to put coins into like a meter to turn the lights on. Um, and it's really freezing in there. It seems like nobody's been in there for a really long time. Peter's, Peter goes straight to the kitchen to prepare some food for them. And Sarah takes a little walk around the house. And when she comes back, she says, I don't like it here and I wanna go. There is something weird and wrong about this house and I'm pretty sure something bad happened here. Peter is really not in the mood to hear this. <laughs> and so he tells her to wait until the morning and it'll probably be better. And you know, they came here all this way just give it a chance. The next day, Sarah's still not liking the house, but she's trying to deal with it because Peter really wants her to. In the afternoon, they head to the village and go to a bar and have some lunch. And it's, But as soon as they walk in, they notice that all the locals are staring at them, but these locals won't engage with them at all. Both of them are pretty sure that this is probably just local people not wanting city tourists coming into their bar. So they leave, they go home for the night, um, but in the middle of the night, Peter gets up to go inspect something. He thinks he hears something. And when he comes back, Sarah is gone. Poof. Vanished. He can't find her anywhere. She didn't take her purse. She didn't take any shoes. She didn't take any clothes. She was just in her nightgown. She's just gone. Peter looks on the grounds for her and he even goes to the cliffs to see maybe she fell over the side or something, but there was nothing there. When he gets back, Sarah still hasn't returned and he just hopes that, you know, she'll come back the next day. Well, the next day comes and she's not there. He decides to go to the bar to see if maybe she walked into town and if anyone's seen her. But the bartender tells him, no, she's not been here. Peter takes this opportunity to ask why the locals just won't talk to him. The bartender reveals the reason is, is because they're staying at that house. And it's rumored to be haunted. Failing to find any information about Sarah, he heads back home and just decides to wait it out and see if she'll return. Her family and his family are not very happy with this and encourage him to go to the police, which he does. And this starts an investigation to where is Sarah? 
So The Vanishment is a very tricky story because there's a lot of there's a lot of layers to the story that are kind of happening at once. For instance, the main character Peter, right off the bat, like when we begin to hear his thoughts and and, and stuff like that, it's like it's apparent that Peter has a past. You know, that it's there's something, but it's not just like, you know, a regular past. It's like there's something weird about his past, but you know, we don't know what that is, but we get little hints here and there, but they're very subtle. They're very, you know, they're very vague, but it really builds up this uh, mistrust, you know, like I don't trust Peter. Like every time he's doing something or thinking something, like I don't trust him. So it sort of has me on this like high alert, like whenever he's doing anything, like I, I can't even tell, you know, if he's doing something because he really wants to, you know, solve the problem or be, if there's some other ulterior motive, I can't tell. We have their marriage, which is obviously on the rocks and, you know, they're trying to find a way to repair it, but we don't really know what the reasons are for that. You know, they, they reveal themselves later, but in the beginning, we're not really too sure. And then we have the house itself. There's many little mysteries about the house why it was rented, why it's empty, who lived there, you know, what happened there, stuff like that. Then we have the friends of the, the main character and his wife who seem to not like Peter very much, but it's never really exactly expressed, but it's something you can kind of just glean from like their conversations together, but you don't know why. So it's sort of like you have all of this like information, but it, it's all sort of like so vague that you're not really sure exactly what to do with it. So you're, you're kind of just stuck in this position of like, I don't know. It's really towards like the last 20% of the book that we start getting our answers and we start kind of figuring, you know, understanding like what's happening. And all of the characters were just like, I really didn't understand like where they stood. So because I didn't understand where any of these characters stood at all, I didn't really know who to trust or who to like. So when I was going through the story of the vanishment, I was getting distracted a lot by by Peter's character. All of this like white noise that he had behind him, which I didn't know what it was. So when the supernatural stuff was happening, it didn't have the impact that I think it should have had because I was just really distracted with Peter's character. Obviously this is not a movie, but as an example, like I didn't know what to look at. So that made it a little bit exhausting for me just trying to like feel like, okay, what's important here? You know, I don't really know. So what I liked about The Vanishment was I really liked how the in-laws and the family and his ex-wife responded to him and like what their relationships were like. They seemed pretty familiar and, you know, realistic in a sense, you know, like I thought that was really well done. And I think that was like the most grounding thing for me in the book were like these, these like relationships that were obviously deteriorated, but you know, had to exist because you know, they're, they're in-laws or they're married or you know, whatever. And what I most especially liked, which I wish had been like a bigger part of the book was why, like was the origin story of like the, the ghost haunting itself, why it happened. The event that, you know, created it was real dark, real fucked up. Um, <laughs> I was just like, damn. So I really wanted to know more about that because it sounded really intriguing and just, it was really horrific. So I feel like when like something horrific is happening, I want to know more about it and just, you know, I don't know, all the gory details, <laughs> I guess, you know? There's inheritance here, there's gothic elements, there's reincarnation, there's uh, murder, uh, there's cannibalism, ghosts. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in here. So I gave The Vanishment three and a half stars. I'm gonna be reading uh, Whispers in the Dark at some point, which I heard is really good. Uh, this was actually recommended to me by a commenter here on YouTube. So thank you so much for recommending this to me. 
Whew. I feel like I talked like way too much. It's like dark in here now. <laughs> um, but don't worry, I will always edit it down just to the, the good bits. Thank you so much to the Blood Crones on Patreon for supporting me, supporting this channel. Really, really appreciate it so, 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 so much. Please take care of yourselves, wear a mask, and look out for each other. I'll talk to you next time.